And then when he got his first katana, he said he threw the K-bar away because that was a far superior weapon for eliminating human life. It was the end of the rodeo, and, and my wife, Rain, was, she was getting all antsy, and she, about 20 minutes later, she comes back crying. She can't even talk, and it's full of text messages and voicemails. Everybody telling me what had happened to Cody. Once you take the genie out of the bottle, you can't put it back in. You have to, you have to work through it. And she wasn't willing to do that. So she killed herself with drugs and alcohol. Um, this is something that I want to make a film about. I want to talk about this because uh, I was with my former wife for 13 years. And uh, for seven, eight years, she was sober. And when she was sober, it was, she was amazing. Like she, I, I give her a lot of credit for helping me build my career because, because she, uh, she didn't know anything about art or anything like that when I met her. So I taught her how to do photography. I taught her to do marketing, all this stuff. But what she was is she was a social butterfly, which I am not. And she could sell refrigerators to Eskimos. No insult intended. I mean, she just could sell. And, uh, and she loved it. She, she loved the going to shows and everything. I mean, one time I did 14 shows a year. But I was making bank. It was great. I mean, and that's one thing that I take a great deal of pride in. So I can count on one hand all the Native American jewelers I know that make 100% of their living from their art. Because you just can't do it. Everybody else has something else. Wife with a good job, they're per cap, they're retired, you know, something else. But for 30 years, I've done it with my art. Because I sold my ranch, I got out of the cow business because I, I couldn't do both. I mean, when I dedicated myself, it was, I was all in. There was no plan B. Burn the ships. You know, and, and I did okay. But when I met my wife, it really just, I did this like this rocket deal. Well, um, there was a lot of extenuating things that happened, but um, she started drinking. Well, she went back to college. She wanted to finish college because she had never finished college. And then she got around people that, you know, they were younger and they were, you know, and she sort of fell into this deal. Well, when that happened, it triggered other things. And, and, and I'll fast forward through it and everything, but we started going to therapy. I'm a big believer in therapy and everything. Well, she was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And we got to a point where she refused to get the help she needed. And for the best interest of all of my, my kids and everything, we had to part company. And a lot of people don't know this, but most people with borderline personality disorder die from suicide. It's unintentional because they use suicide as a form of, of manipulation. And part of what her deal was is, you know, she started using drugs and alcohol. And when you do that, it affects your brain chemistry and everything. And there's all these bad things that happen. Well, I continue to go to therapy and everything. And I had to learn about borderline personality disorder to understand what she was dealing with. And for a long time, I was really mad at her because my thing was, and my anger was, how can you choose drugs and alcohol over your family? How do you do that, you know? And, and this was something that brought back these memories of my grandfather, my Che, because he was an alcoholic. And I had to work through all that because what I didn't understand was my Che joined the Marines when he was 15 years old and they sent him straight to the South Pacific. He joined before they ever had the Navajo Code Talkers. And he had a chance to be a Code Talker, but he chose not to. But he was a tunnel rat. And I don't know if you know what that is, but those guys were the ones that went into the tunnels after the Japanese. And he never told us anything about what they did, except that he never understood why the Marines issued him a firearm because all he ever needed was a K-bar. And then when he got his first katana, he said he threw the K-bar away because that was a far superior weapon for eliminating human life. That was what he did. And I didn't understand until I went through therapy that the reason why he was drinking was because he had what we now understand as PTSD. So I come out of this environment of people that 
have given their lives and psychology and their normalcy and whatever you want to call it to, for us so that we can live the lives we live. But I learned because of therapy with my wife and everything, her father started having sex with her when she was eight years old. That was the foundation of her PTSD. And then every other man in her life used her in some way. Teachers, I mean, sheriffs, all kinds of people. And so when her, when her borderline personality disorder took off and was triggered and everything, it, the way my therapist explained it was, is once you take the genie out of the bottle, you can't put it back in. You have to, you have to work through it. And she wasn't willing to do that. So she killed herself with drugs and alcohol. And, and like I said, I was really, really mad for a long time. And um, the thing that makes me angry now is her dad and all these other men that abused her are still alive. They're still walking around, still doing it, you know? And they're protected by their communities and by their families. And, you know, and even her own mother wouldn't stand up for her. You know, she's in denial. It's this whole, it's this whole network. It doesn't happen unless other people facilitate it. And, and so that was something, you know, when I was thinking about film and everything, because I know so many people that have been through similar situations, you know, you can't stop it unless you start talking about it, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's just been one of those things. So she, she died in, uh, in January of 2020 and, uh, less than a month later, my son passed. He, uh, he was drugged to death by a horse at the ranch in Lincoln County. And I, you know, it's still hard for me, but this is the way I look at it. I got nine bonus years with my son because on July 2nd of 2011 in Lincoln County at Capitan, New Mexico, my son had a horse flip over on him in the saddle bronc riding and crush him. And essentially it killed him. They airlifted him to El Paso. The only thing that was keeping him alive was machines. And um, they brought him back. So I tell everybody, I got nine bonus years. You know, I can, I can be mad about losing him, but I should have lost him in 2011. And 2011, that day was a tough day because January or July 11th or July 2nd in 2011, um, we were going to Gallup for the junior high national finals bunch of kids that rodeoed with my daughter were in the finals and stuff and I get a telephone call as we're getting ready to leave the house my mom said uh, your dad had a major stroke and uh, he is being airlifted to Albuquerque he said go to the rodeo he's not going to die because they were supposed to meet us at the rodeo that day and because they live in Chinle, Arizona and uh, so we did we went to the rodeo and then we were sitting at the rodeo it was the end of the rodeo, and, and my wife, Rain, she was getting all antsy, and she, you know, she's like, something's wrong. Her phone died. She's like, I need to charge my phone, I need to charge my phone. And everybody we were with were like, no, no, there's two kids, and two, there were two Navajo boys getting ready to rope, and they were like, wait until they go, and then you can go charge your phone. They rope, she runs and charges her phone. About 20 minutes later, she comes back crying. She can't even talk, and she just hands me the phone, and it's full of text messages and voicemails, everybody telling me what had happened to Cody at about 2 p.m. that afternoon in Capitan. And um, so I left my daughter and my wife and my other kids in Gallup. And I, to this day, I don't know who gave me a ride. Somebody gave me a ride home, back to Albuquerque. I got in my wife's car, I drove to El Paso. And uh, um, Jerry Hawks, who uh, is a retired professor from New Mexico State, but he, uh, his son rodeoed with my son, Ubi, his son, Ubi. And Ubi was in the bull riding at Ridoso. Well, Jerry went with my son so he wouldn't be alone to El Paso. Left his son who still had to ride a bull. So as soon as I get to El Paso, Jerry's like, I got to go. Ubi got mucked out in the bull riding. He's in the hospital in Rio Doso. So I, I, I can never give enough gratitude to Jerry for being there with Cody, you know. But, um, but it was a miracle because in four days, we had him home. Two weeks later, he won a saddle at a roping. And they had to completely rebuild his face. He had bleeding on the brain. His, uh, his lungs were crushed. I mean, when I say they rebuilt his face, they, he had no nose. He had no cheekbones. It was all completely redone. 
took him over a year to get his depth perception back and everything. It was the craziest thing. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really cool story. And he kept doing it. He kept doing it, yeah. It, because, you know what, I'll tell you why. And I take 100%, I take 100% responsibility slash credit for this. But I tell my kids, life is short. Have fun. Do what you love. And, and that's what I've always told them. I said, you got to do what you love because you only get one go around that I know of. And it's too short and it's too precious not to do what you enjoy. And that's all I've ever done, you know, for whatever it's worth. That's, that's all I've ever done. You know, people may say I'm irresponsible because, you know, I didn't make better choices in some situations. And, you know, nowadays, Sometimes it's hard to lift my arms over my head and, you know, different things, but, but, but I had a good time, you know, and, and in the end, that's all that matters, you know. I mean, you can have all the money in the world, but if you didn't have a good time, what was it worth? And I know a lot of people like that, you know, they're rich and miserable. But this program was definitely um, a healing process for me. And um, it really helped me with my anger because I had a lot of anger. I mean, I don't, I don't know how other people go through uh, grief, but a lot of my grief was, there was a lot of anger there. It was tough. But you don't know who to be mad at or who to hit or, you know, I don't know how I don't know how to explain it, but you just you know there's a lot of and and coming into this program and then because I had to do a lot of the research I did and everything it it was like because I've been through a lot of therapy and therapy is a great thing, but making art gives you an outlet for all those things you're working through, at least for me and and in a way. It, it manifests, it becomes a physical manifestation of the emotions, the ideas, and the feelings that you're, that you're dealing with, you know? And some days it's good and some days it's bad. But, but once you get it out, like for me, once I get it out, like via my art, then I can put it away. I can walk away from it, you know? I'm not... It's not that never-ending thing. So yeah, it became, a, it became a healing thing for me. But I didn't come into it intending that. It, it was just a, it was the universe working on my behalf, providing opportunities and blessings. Yeah. For a little background, I, I grew up ranching. My mom and dad ranched in Arizona, New Mexico, and Nevada. My dad's from Oklahoma. They have this stuff in Oklahoma it grows like this tall and it's green and cows get fat on it. They call it grass. So I spent my entire life perplexed because we lived in places where, you see this right here? There'd be a clump of it there, clump of it over there, clump of it over there. And like Baxter Black says, you got to have cows that jump from clump to clump. It's grass, but it's, sparse, it's sparsely spaced. And you do a lot of praying for rain. And I tell my kids, you got to be careful what you pray for because the holy ones are always listening and they will give you exactly what you ask for. I prayed for rain my entire life and then she showed up and gave me 13 great years. <laughs> she didn't come out of the sky, but... <laughs> so I tell them, be specific. <laughs> you got to pray with intention. You can't just, you know, because you, they'll give it to you. You're going to get it. But no, so... Uh, my dad was a horse trainer. My granddad raised world champion quarter horses. And, and my dad used to buy horses off the track and everything. And so I grew up, and, and, and my mom's uncle raised horses. And, you know, but horses when I was a kid are different than horses today. Today, horses are well-bred. People are breeding them and trying to get really good um, temperaments and everything. Well, and a lot of people won't know what this is, but I grew up with them big knot-headed Roman nose horses that would paw you, bite you, run over you, and kick you. And um, they were tough, you know, and they were good, but they, they were rank. And so I grew up with them kind of horses, 
And one thing I learned about myself through therapy is I'm a fixer. You know, if there's something that needs to be fixed or somebody needs help, I'm that guy, like it or not. I've come to grips with that's who I am. But I'm also that way with horses. So I was always buying the horses that gave other people problems. I was always getting those horses. When I was young, I used to break a lot of horses and people would bring me all their, their knotheads. And I'd get them going, you know, because back then, otherwise they'd go straight to the killers. And, you know, I wanted to give everybody a chance to realize their potential, if you will. So my kids growing up, they grew up with these knot-headed horses too, for better or worse. And um, I'll tell you a quick story because it's funny. So my son was about, I want to say he was 11 years old. And this is pre-internet. So I used to get the Sunday paper and go through the want ads and everything. Back then they'd have listings for horses and cattle and different things, you know, because you're always trying to trade, make little money. And so Cody... Um, he, uh, he had bought a horse with my mom a year and a half earlier, and he trained this horse to rope. And he sold it to some team roper and made a bunch of money, and he thought, I am a horse trainer. So he was determined. He had his own money. He was going to go buy another horse, and, you know, he's, he was thinking like a businessman. I'm going to build on this thing. Goes through the one ads in the newspaper. He finds this horse, and he says, Dad, can we go look at it? And I said, okay, we'll go look at it. So we drive over to this guy's house. And um, when we get there, there's a little girl off crying in the corner and the horse is standing there kind of spread a legged and everything. And I'm like, she just got bucked off. And uh, so we're sitting there looking at the horse and we're talking to the guy and everything. And I was like, well, can we ride him? He's like, no, no, not today. It's not ready. And so, you know, all the red flags came up and everything. And I told Cody, I said, let's go. And he's like, dad, I want to buy that horse. They literally raped their way through the Southwest. And what they would do is they would, they would buy and sell indigenous slaves, mainly young girls. So the church would get the girls. They would keep, the church was the broker, but most of these people still know that they're from descendant ancestry. And so when you do their DNA test, they test, you know, at least 40% indigenous blood. So this stock tank is indicative of, you know, water is life. And especially here in the Southwest, you know, it's a, it's a such a rare commodity. <laughs>